Well, I think it's important for primary care providers or anyone taking care of chronic pain patients to realize that the central nervous system plays a very prominent role in pain processing. And in many individuals in whom we see that the central nervous system is amplifying their pain, they also are having amplifications also from their brain of other sensory experiences. So if you encounter a chronic pain patient um, who comes into you with pain and they also uh, endorse the fact that they're sensitive to the brightness of light, the loudness of noises, odors, uh, or even if they have a lot of side effects of drugs. Um, those are all clues that the person is more globally sensory hyper-responsive. And what that should indicate to a clinician is that part of their pain, or maybe all of their pain, is really coming more so from the brain than it is the area of the body where they're experiencing pain. This is really important because the drug and the non-drug treatments that work to treat pain that is coming from the brain uh, the, the, this, this would be classically conditions like fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, headache, interstitial cystitis, <clears throat> are entirely different than the drug and the non-drug therapies that work for pain that is due to a damage or inflammation in the region of the body where the person's experiencing pain. So we re refer to these pain states as centralized pain states in, in that the central nervous system is playing a more prominent role and the title incorporating um, the sensory system was in part to get the audience to start thinking along those lines so that they could better identify those patients that they see in routine clinical practice and know that even though this person might be coming in with knee pain, that knee pain might more so be coming from the brain and thus it's not going to respond to surgery, injections, opioids, non that we would give for knee pain that is coming from the knee. Yeah, the main demarcation are the, the classic drugs that, and non-drug approaches that we've used for pain that is nociceptive pain or pain that is occurring because of damage or inflammation in the area of the body where the person's experiencing pain. The classes of drugs would be non-steroidals, um, opioids, the uh, other types of interventions that we would use would be injections, surgical procedures, but um, if someone has knee pain because of that underlying mechanism of pain, then they're likely to respond well to non and maybe opioids. They're likely to do well if you inject their knee or you do surgery on their knee. A different individual who's also experiencing pain in his or her knee, that when you examine them you see that they don't just have pain in their knee, they have pain in a couple other locations in the body. They have symptoms that are also coming from the brain like fatigue, sleep problems, memory problems, um, and they have these symptoms of sensory hyper-responsiveness. Uh, they're bothered by the brightness of lights, the loudness of noises, odors, and things like that. Physicians need to get better at identifying that symptom pattern, and when they see that symptom pattern, it should really be a blinking neon light to them that some or much of this person's pain is coming from the brain, so I'm gonna have to switch over to um, some of the drugs that are working primarily in the brain. The uh, older drugs would be some of the tricyclic drugs. The newer drugs would be the gabapentinoids, the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Um, even cannabinoids um, would probably be preferred class of drugs for those individuals rather than opioids or non-steroidals. The non-pharmacologic treatment options are extremely important in these types of syndromes because uh, uh, our drugs to treat this type of pain are not as effective as drugs we have to treat other diseases. So, um, and, and some of the underlying pathogenesis of central or brain pain probably is due to some of the sleep difficulties that people have, um, a lack of exercise uh, can turn up the volume control in your brain. So we use uh, therapies, non-drug therapies, like getting people sleeping better. I'm um, using non-drug approaches to uh, sleep hygiene. Uh, we are really aggressive about first getting people just moving and then getting them exercising, but we really rely more heavily on the non-drug therapies for these centralized pain states than we do for peripheral pain states where we, we have more options because at the end of the day we can do surgery, we can do injections, we have more 
ways we can treat that kind of pain. We can't inject the brain. We can't, or we don't now do surgery on the brain for pain. Cannabinoids actually seem to be quite effective for centralized pain in contrast to opioids where there never have been any studies suggesting that opioids uh, work in conditions like fibromyalgia. There are several studies that suggest cannabinoids do work. Well done, classic parallel group randomized controlled trials. Um, and that's also the case in neuropathic pain. So I think the two underlying mechanisms of pain where cannabinoids might have a better evidence base than opioids would be centralized pain states, which are very common in the neuropathic pain states. But the meta-analyses of um, the cannabinoid trials in neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia um, have shown overwhelmingly positive results. And I think one of the big problems, both with physicians as well as with patients with cannabinoids, is they have a tendency to conflate recreational use of cannabinoids, which makes people high, makes them lethargic and amotivated and things like that with medicinal use of cannabinoids. Uh, patients rarely have those side effects, but um, a lot of the physicians, for example, I give talks a lot on cannabinoids and a lot of physicians come into the talks with, uh, for what I would otherwise call a reefer madness view of uh, cannabinoids. They, uh, and part of that is driven by misinformation, but part of it is driven by conflating the, the, if you will, the side effect profile or the, the what happens when people intentionally try to use a cannabinoid to get high versus when they take it at a much lower dose and are trying to avoid getting high because they're trying to take that medication for its therapeutic benefit without getting high, without getting the munchies, without getting the things that would make you not want to take that as a medicine for your chronic pain. I think it's very clear that fibromyalgia is the poster child for a centralized pain state. It seems like a lot of people who have conditions like fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, interstitial cystitis, headache, these different conditions that all uh, aggregate together in individuals and in families and are um, clearly gen familial, genetic, um, that these conditions uh, are really start as a brain problem. It probably they start as hyperactivity in different brain regions that are involved in pain and sensory processing. Um, and that's why these individuals begin in their childhood or their teens experiencing pain in different areas of the body. The typical individual who gets diagnosed with fibromyalgia at age 35, 40, 45, always has five, six, seven regional pain conditions earlier in their life, usually things like uh, painful menstrual periods, growing pains, uh, functional abdominal pain, headaches, when they're in their childhood or their teens and in their 20s, then they have some visceral pain and some neck pain and some back pain. And then finally, when their pain becomes so widespread um, that, that, it is, that they would meet criteria for fibromyalgia, we say they have fibromyalgia, but they didn't develop fibromyalgia at age 35. They were born with uh, the propensity to ha be pain prone and have this sensory and pain amplification that's originating in their brain. Um, and so there really are two types of centralized pain. One is the, the type that I would actually feel comfortable calling central sensitization. And those are the people who, for example, have a condition like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, cancer pain, but superimposed upon that, they have the exact same features as someone with fibromyalgia would have. They'd have widespread pain, fatigue, memory problems, sleep disturbances. Um, those individuals where the CNS process might be partly driven by ongoing nociceptive input out in the periphery, like the models that Clifford originally um, wrote about, those individuals might respond both to an, an intervention that would re reduce their ongoing nociceptive input and an intervention that would be aimed at their central nervous system. And we refer to those people as more the bottom-up form of centralized pain because it is being driven by something wrong out in the body. But the top-down um, types of centralized pain patients that are more common in younger individuals in their childhood, their teens, their 20s, the 30s, 40s. The most common chronic pain conditions in humans um, under age 50 are now all um, by and large thought to be more brain pain or centralized pain states than they are 
problems out in the periphery. Again, headache, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, interstitial cystitis, um, temporomandibular joint disorder. Those all affect 5, 10, 15 percent of the population individually, and in aggregate, probably 20 percent of the population has one or more of those conditions. Um, and those are more, I think, classic top-down forms.